we could we could be faced with an avalanche of really high quality cases that we didn't know about, yeah. corroborated incidents, high you know very senior military people come out of the woodwork, and I think if that happens, that can only create pressure on what I call the dam, and yeah. eventually the dam will break. And when it breaks, that's when you get disclosure. It's not going to be a slow trickle. It will be, it'll culminate in a you collapse. You think so? Yes, Absolutely. I think it, yeah. yeah. Because it'll reach a point of no return. And at the moment, we're edging towards that with this legislation, uh, proposed legislation. So I think, you know, within the next two, three years, we could really have this paradigm shift. And everybody, regardless of your beliefs, acknowledges that as and when uh, official contact is acknowledged, um, that it will be the most profound moment in human history. Welcome, everybody. Today I have as my guest Gary Heseltine, uh, one of the leading figures of the international UFO community. Welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me. So, uh, I know a little bit about you, but I think it's better that you uh, tell the audience and, and, and me about your background and why you started doing this and what made you interested and got you hooked on this very okay. interesting subject. Okay, my interest in the subject of UFOs originally began with a childhood sighting when I was 16. Uh, cutting a long story short, uh, I saw a strange white light that appeared to trigger a number of power cuts in the area. I moved geographically via my bicycle to a second area where, where I lived. And so from the first sighting to the second sighting was about a mile distant. And as the object passed over my rooftop, I put my arm up in the, like answering a question in the class. And then no sooner did it go past my arm, the whole area was plunged into darkness. Hmm. And that was ridiculous because how could I predict the power cut? So I knew that that object, whatever it was, yeah. had somehow interacted with the power grid because I'd moved geographically about a mile yeah. and, pre and predicted it literally to the second. So that's what kicked off my interest, but I didn't do anything really. I joined a local UFO club briefly, but I all thought they were crazy, so I didn't stay. Yeah. Um, I then kind of away, went away and had a life. I joined the Air Force. Uh, I was in the Air Force Police for six years until 1989. Came out in 1989, joined the British Transport Police in the UK, and then went on to have a 24-year career, uh, the last 19 years of which was as a detective. Mm. I was an advanced interviewer of suspects and witnesses, and my particular interest lay in interviewing people. I liked the so psychology, so as an advanced interviewer, I was qualified to interview for murder, manslaughter, rape. I was also involved in the London Bombers terrorist incident, interviewing first responding police officers to the various three of the four scenes, um, which is really interesting. Uh, while I was still a serving detective, uh, in 2002 I launched an, an unofficial national database to collect British police officer UFO mm. sightings. And I began with half a dozen sightings involving maybe 10 or 12 officers. Now, all these years later, I have over 550 cases, going back to 1901, involving 1,100 officers approximately. Wow. So a lot, and that's how I became known within the UFO community. Yeah. Um, I'd never done lectures uh, of any kind. I'd always been a comfortable speaker, but never done anything on a big scale. But then I began to uh, get a lot of media mm. because I was a police officer and yeah. giving credibility to the subject. But you, you weren't able to work with this within the police force? No, 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 no. no, no. Mm. That, that, that was like shunned and I was kind of told that it probably wouldn't be good for my career, and it wasn't, because as time went on, and the more successful I became, the more rules they, they imposed on me. Yeah. Um, and was one of the reasons why I decided to leave early. Um, I left in 2013 to create my own online e-zine called UFO Truth Magazine, uh, which is a PDF format uh, that's sent bi-monthly, uh, 96 pages featuring articles by most of the top researchers that I've met mm. over the years. I've been internationally lecturing since 2010 and probably done now 20 countries, 21 countries so far. So I'm very lucky that I've made my passion into a job yeah. uh, and continued it after I retired from the police. And so I'm, I can't count myself very lucky. 
and you're now the vice president of something called the I ICER. ICER, the, the International, International Coalition for Extraterrestrial Research. Yeah, this stems from uh, originally a Chinese initiative uh, from 2018. Uh, a couple of colleagues who were involved earlier than me in the project uh, were asked to go to China uh, and they had uh, they were asked to go back and identify suitable researchers to come together as a coalition to try to I guess create a disclosure type movement internationally mm. um, as part of that process I was asked to go to Moscow uh, in October of 2018 and there, there was nine of us met with the Chinese delegation. Uh, this was unofficial, but you say unofficial because nothing happens in China without it being official. Sure. So, so we had this discussion, and the idea was to create the coalition um, in a this kind of international disclosure moment. Unfortunately, after a year, there was no activity to follow up on the promises that the Chinese had made. Um, so, basically. In, the, in that sense, the Chinese initiative ended. Yeah. But it coincided that by early 2020, just in time for the first lockdown in the UK, mm. so March, April of 2020, um, everybody was then using Zoom as a way to keep in touch with relatives. So I said, well, we'd already identified maybe 15 or 16 potential countries to get involved, researchers-wise, and uh, I said, well, perhaps this is the time to try the Zoom. So I took out a professional Zoom account and then started getting people together. And from there, we then began to prepare for a uh, public release. We registered uh, as an international NGO, non-government organization. So we're not a group. Uh, we have laws, that uh, EU laws, because we're registered in Portugal. And we now have... We launched in May of 2021, mm. and we now have 30 national representatives. So in UFO terms, it's a mixture of UFO experts, uh, scientists, and academics, which is a very unusual mm. mix in mm. this subject. And the broader um, aim is to prepare people for what we think is going to be a, a, a coming paradigm shift, yeah. which is this, we talk about this disclosure with a big D, and what we mean by that is, when it's universally acknowledged 24-7 on the news that ET is real or there is an inter uh, uh, interdimensional non-human presence uh, interacting with, it, with planet Earth. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to do. We're developing courses to uh, for all sectors of society, religion, aviation, education, etc. We've just done our first uh, free at the point of access uh, evidential history course which I ran uh, and put on and will be running another course in the next few months uh, so the idea is to start to prepare people because we feel that uh, the world is vastly underprepared mm. uh, and with the things that are taking place in America we think that you know there's a real possibility in the next two years this uh, admission shall we say or uh, uh, acknowledgement that we're dealing with a non-human interaction is going to come true. And yeah. I think the vast majority of people, because the subject has been so ridiculed for so long, are unprepared, or certainly a section of the public will be underprepared, like mm -hmm. COVID, uh, with lockdowns and the psychological trauma that it caused to people. So I think we're trying to just, in our own way, trying to get the international community together to say, look, all governments, all nations now need to accept that this is about to mm. come true mm. and you have done nothing to prepare the public because you've been led to believe that there was nothing. Yeah. So there's going to be this real culture shock if we're not careful. And so that's what we're trying to do. And we're trying to take um, our aims to the highest levels of governance. We've got a project going called Project Titan, which is uh, basically a small country, San Marino. Uh, we've I met with the culture minister um, and we gave our plans for Project Titan. And Project Titan is basically you need a nation state to sponsor you in a mm. sense. So you get a foot yeah. into the... Yeah, yeah. UN, yes, so, so, the yes, yes. It, it has to be at the national level. Yeah. So we have gone to uh, San Marino who have, who have uh, a long association 
with one of the local uh, Italian UFO groups, yes. and so they basically know that uh, and have helped fund conferences in the past for the last thirty years. So there is a bond there already. So now we've gone back to them and say, look, now is the time that we would like you to adopt our initiative and approach the UN on behalf of San Marino mm. to make San Marino the United Nations capital mm. for further research into the extraterrestrial and That's be funded. Right. Yeah. So a bit like the Geneva Convention uh -huh. for the Second World War and how to treat people as captives, this would put San Marino on the map so it would be good for tourism, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I understand that you focus mainly on on uh, modern modern day UFO reports. I mean, the report that, yeah. that have been coming from since the Roswell incident in 1947 and onwards, and you don't uh, delve very much into like um, ancient documents that could be interpreted as if they were describing UFO uh, UFOs. I mean, we, we we totally acknowledge that there are lots of strange aerial sightings that yeah. have gone back thousands of years. However, because it's too far back, we concentrate on what we would call the yeah. modern era, so yeah. from the 1940s onwards. And, you know, we basically say in the last 75 yeah. years, all of our representatives have had to sign an oath, uh, which was basically saying, based on the evidence of the last 75 years, based on pilots, radar operators, uh, air traffic controllers, etc., very credible people, mm -hmm. that there is based on that high quality reporting there is a small percentage of UFO cases yeah. that we believe is dealing with a non-human mm -hmm. i.e. probably extraterrestrial but there may also be an interdimensional mm -hmm. aspect either way it's non-human uh, and so that's why we've all put out that oath because it, we, we want to be like-minded and that puts us all together on the same page yeah. and uh, so far so good you know we're having behind the scenes we're having meetings with diplomats and things like that. Yeah, These early days. Early talk, talk about this, those uh, events and reports, uh, of course, but I just want to ask, since it, it so happens that we're sitting here in Peru, <laughs> of all Peru. places, talking about this for different um, reasons, but, um, and we have been, you and I have seen so many fantastic megalithic sites. That, oh, absolutely. I mean, defy explanation. It's, it, yeah, defy explanation, and, and you, you, you might, it's not implausible that, that there might have been some extraterrestrial Entities, Absolute, absolutely. I mean, steering uh, this uh, thing uh, up, and uh, uh, so would you have any opinion about that, or do you? Do you no, want to... I, I, I'm, I'm very open mm. to the idea that we've been visited in the past, because through ancient megaliths, uh, structures, uh, petroglyphs, those kind of thing, uh, it, it, you know, all around the world there are strange rock art petroglyphs that don't appear to show human figures uh you know there are some spectacular ones in australia yeah. there are some spectacular ones in uh, north america in fact all around the world so I, I yeah i i absolutely am open to the idea but the only problem is with that is we can never actually prove it mm. we can speculate and we can say well it could be but we'll never go prove it we want to live in the real world now evidentially and obviously my you and i sir yeah yeah mm -hmm. uh, and speaking uh, as the vice president of ISA, uh, we're very much evidential and scientific based and uh, we think now is the time that you the data is there and it should be studied and i think and i think we think that the more it is studied uh, the more it will point to you dealing with something that's off world yeah i think most listeners and viewers are uh, know about this um, um what the pentagon released last year i think it was last year yes yeah december yeah. To, yeah december a memorandum uh, brief memorandum uh, but it it uh, disclosed that there were more than 140 documented sightings of uh, well the well the report was published UAPs. on the 25th of june yeah. 2022 yeah. 2021 20, yeah. uh, which was a month after he launched we did it we came out a month earlier purposely to strategically place ourselves okay, yeah. a month before its launch. Yeah. Uh, when it came out, it basically said of 144 cases, yeah. they couldn't explain 143. Um, if anybody has followed the UFO subject and keen developments in the last four or five years, since 2017, there's been really a sea change. And yeah, that, there was a report in the New York yeah, Times. That's, yeah, that yeah. started it, and then there were three, uh, the release of three US Navy 
confirmed and authenticated videos that showed something clearly moving around. Mm. And because these were Navy authenticated videos, I think really for the first time the media could ask the question, what is that? Mm. And of course, the pilots who've since gone on the record in several of these incidents have, have basically said they were dealing something which they'd never seen before. Yeah. And the way the objects moved was quite unlike anything they'd ever seen. So yeah. pointing to a likely extraterrestrial explanation. You think it's genuinely, is this genuinely new stuff or is it old? old? No, I, I don't think the, the, the objects and their manoeuvres are nothing new mm. in terms of UFO research. Mm. Uh, we, we're talking about cases of instant acceleration, instant stop, vertical climb, vertical descent, you know, right angle turns. These have been noted since the 1940s. Yeah. Uh, but uh, obviously, because of the way the subject was treated stigma-wise, nobody really accepted that or it was never really publicised in the, in the mainstream mm. because it was kind of laughed at. Yeah. But now, many scientists are now getting involved in UAP research, and I think one of the reasons for that is that the, I think our level of technology is advanced to the stage where certainly military sensors on board ships, mm. on board aircraft, mm. are picking these things up mm. in a way that they couldn't do before. So now there is a, a, a way to track them, uh, a way to record the data, and of course, that data needs studying. Mm. Uh, but you know, when you, when we talk about what we're dealing with, even though the press, the mainstream press, would like to think that this is foreign adversary, yeah. as in China, that's what you uh, read sometimes. Russia, yeah, uh, you talk to people who were who uh, involved at the sharp end of this, mm. the likes of Chris Mellon, um, Luis Elizondo, mm. who ran the ATIP program. They're saying literally it's a one percent chance, okay. and that's yeah. a small one percent yeah. because the three, yeah all the three th uh, videos. There are three videos. Yeah, three videos, but there's subsequently been several more. There's another one that uh, was released by Jeremy Corbell, showing an object that seems to be on the alongside a ship, a military ship, that then suddenly is there, is there, and then it appears to dip in all the water mm. and go out of sight. Mm. And there's no splash or anything like that. So there are some authenticated videos now, uh, and. The re last year's uh, American legislation w was absolutely historic because what it said was, for the first time, the intelligence community, all the you know the CIA, the NSA, etc., they had to deliver uh, a classified report to Congress twice a year, mm. and an unclassified report once a year. That's unique. That's unique. Never happened before because it was always the intelligence community had really controlled this subject. But now, by law, signed off by the president, they have to report. Well, it now, as we're, you know, here in Peru, the, the, the second report, uh, classified report, was due to be released on the 31st of October and delivered to Congress. Well, there's some debate about whether that's happened or not, okay. uh, but it certainly hasn't received any real press Sounds attention. Shady. <laughs> well, I think that's because, in all honesty, the intelligence community don't really want to respond. No. So they like kicking and screaming, being told that they have to do it, but they don't want to do it because they've controlled the subject for far too mm. long. But what we do know is that when uh, there was a classified briefing to Congress and Senate, Last year, many of the senators and Congress people were like shown 40 minutes of UFO videos, and many of them have gone on to say that uh, mm -hmm. the hair stood up on the back of their oh. heads and they felt they were watching something like science fiction. Yeah. So that kind of says where we're at now. That's the, the obviously the classified world, the unclassified world. We're dealing with two or three minutes of videos, mm. poor grainy videos, yeah. but we know that the better stuff is out there because many of the senators have actually gone on record. All right, it's near Catalina, and it's off the west coast. And basically, they see something the size of a Boeing 707 just under the water. And then suddenly, the pilot, Commander David Fravor, who's a Top Gun special pilot instructor, he sees what this little white object going <laughs> little angular turns. It's like ping pong ball. You see, what the hell is that? So he says to his other aircraft, I'm going to go down, you just monitor. He's curious, what the fuck is that? And as he stands to spiral towards this object, this object which he describes as a tic-tac suite, 
So a cylindrical object, 40 feet in length, not too short of the plane size used, 58 feet, he was flying. No wings, no propulsion. Suddenly, as he's going down, vectoring towards this object, the object goes and points towards him, as if to say, oh, I see you. And he starts going up as he's coming down. And then blinks off at incredible speed, and he says it was there, and then it broke a lock on, just disappeared. It's like, whoa, I've never seen anything like that. Then he gets a message that the object is 60 miles away at his next waypoint. It's waiting for him. It stopped at his next waypoint. It's like, well, I know where you're going. Either it listened in to the communications, your next waypoint is there, 60 miles away, or it tapped into his brain and said, I've read your brain, it's 60 miles away, but I'm waiting for you. Fleet of them, look on the ASA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Oh, I think, dude. That's not an LNS, though, is it? It's not. That is an LNS, dude. Well, if there's a like other thing, it's rotating. What kind of entities out there do you think could be visiting us like that, in that way? Well, I've seen in these videos. I um, and Dicer uh, put out a statement last year. Yeah, I think it was October time last year, where we basically said, "Look, having examined the whole abduction phenomena that's been really in the in the modern era for about the last twenty years or so." although there were earlier cases from the 50s. But over the last 20 years, in all countries, all countries around the world, even third world countries, they basically tell the same story. And so we put out a press statement on behalf of ISIS to say, look, we've examined the best cases from around the world. We believe that we are dealing with something non-human. Yeah. Uh, now, if you accept that, when you look at the broad abduction scenario across the world, there are five main species that seem to be identified. Mm. The, the, what we call the small grey, the tall grey, the Nordics, which are supposedly like Swedish blonde hair, you know, mm. you, could be that, you could be one of them. <laughs> <Not blonde. laughs> uh, 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 the uh, mantids and the reptilians, mm. they, they crop up all over the world. Mm. So that would seem to me that there are at least five species interacting mm. with people on a certain level. Mm. Uh, how much governments know, mm. uh, especially the American government, we don't know. We mm. only know 10% in the public domain. I would think that they know a hell of a lot more, mm. but we probably will never find out. Yeah, I listened to you yesterday talking about these things and you mentioned, of course, Roswell. You, yeah, Roswell, The first event that, that's kicked this thing off uh, the modern, in the modern era, at least. and. Uh, there's so many legends and myths around that, and what what happened, what actually happened, if they retrieved a UFO, and whether there were uh, living creatures still there, and whether they have. I mean, the, 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 the what's your assessment on this? I believe Roswell was real. I believe that uh, they recovered some kind of crashed flying disc, mm. which is actually what they said until it was retracted six hours later after they went press and it kind of went viral. Uh, I have spoken to uh, Don Schmidt, who is a US based researcher, who is one of our, uh, the national representative for North America and a member of our executive council, the European, uh, the North American uh, director um, for North America and Canada. And uh, I've spoken to him several times about Roswell and he says there is so much wealth of evidence you know i think he said there was something like incidental information involving 800 witnesses mm. uh, and he's very evidential based and it clearly everything that went on afterwards does not ring true if it were a weather balloon mm. or a crash test dummy or something like that which were which are really implausible excuses uh, you know so I think Roswell was real. The question whether they retrieved bodies, well, if you recovered a craft, 
you may well have found bodies. Yeah. It may well not, but we'll never prove that. But we suspect that bodies probably were recovered. Whether some were alive or anything like that, we don't know. It's all speculation. But do I think that there was a real event involving a crash disc? Yes, I do. Which is Roswell. Roswell, even though people have, you know, known nothing about Roswell, they've heard the name. You don't need to know anything about UFOs, but they'll know it's somehow connected to flying saucers. All right? That's how uh, famous Roswell has become. But it was a long time ago, July 1947. And basically what happened was a rancher called Matt Brazil was out on his land near Mexico and he comes across a gouged area of something that's crashed and skidded along the surface and come to a stop. Believed to be a crashed UFO. He then reported it to local Air Force Base. They then set out, sent out their intelligence guy. They recovered all of the wreckage and whatever. Never seen anything like it. It's not a weather balloon as the story went. Loads of stuff covering about a 200 meter area. Okay, loads of metallic. But this metal was really strange because what it, you could pick it up and it was incredibly light. And you could also crunch it up and it would spring back like memory. Has the, U the US government told the public anything of this over the years? Uh, well, no, they, they've basically just allowed the US Air Force to deny it. And like uh, the 50th anniversary, so 1997, they did a, uh, released a book that's saying, you know, it was basically yeah. uh, a crash test dummy. But then researchers found out that the, the, the test, crash test dummies were six foot amorphic human like figures, whereas all the uh, witnesses described small, three foot tall. Right, yeah. Like the, the creatures, grace or yeah, the grace, yeah. No. Uh, so nothing, to say. and also that the amorphic dominance occurred four or five years after Roswell. Mm. That plan wasn't in operation at the time. So I think they they they, they didn't really do a very good job at trying to kill it off. Uh, and I know that people like Luis Elizondo, uh, having talked to him, mm. uh, would say that he, he thinks that something definitely yeah. happened. So would you go? Would you go so far as to say that the, that the U.S. government has lied to the public or for thirty-five years? Uh, they've lied to the government from my point of view, and you know, and, and probably I would say it too. But personally, from my own point of view, mm -hmm. I believe the evidence is very clear that the U.S. government, which has dominated the UFO subject since nineteen forty-seven, yeah, other governments have taken. Have yes, taken I think they've their... followed America's lead because they were the the big superpower mm. uh, and I, th I think they have basically led a campaign of disinformation on the best UFO cases mm. deliberately maybe for our own benefit mm. not impossible that it's for our own benefit maybe they know things that they don't want to tell us because it's been too frightening I allow for that possibility but the point is I think the bottom line is you can't keep lying and I think we're, we're quite close to through technology them losing control. Mm. Uh, for example, uh, if you've heard of the Phoenix Lights yeah, incident was, from 1997. What, what did you give us a couple of more salient, uh, yeah. prominent examples and spectacular well, examples? Well, but, but I, I, I think now this the, the, the Phoenix Lights incident was 1997. Was like, yeah, okay. And basically hundreds, maybe 100,000 people saw a boomerang shaped object moving silently across the sky that eventually ended up and stopped and hovered above uh, Phoenix. Mm. Now at the time several videos were taken but the video technology then, the picture quality was poor and so it wasn't good enough to conclusively prove one way or the other. None showed the, uh, the craft itself, were able to define the craft. They showed lights, the lights that yeah. appeared to show the rim of an edge, but it wasn't the, the quality wasn't there to definitively prove it. Well, you think where we are now, 25 years on, most people carry smartphone technology phones, often phones with 4K, 8K is even becoming possible on some of the phones now. Now, we also have social media uh, where you can go live streaming through the likes of Facebook, exactly, etc. Yeah. Now, I think we're one major incident away from from a, a cataclysm or a, a tipping point. Yeah. Tipping point's yeah. really the point. Mm. And I think that basically 
you know, if the Phoenix Lights incident were to happen in 2022, 23, everybody would be live streaming it and you then could not control mm. the media in, no. in the way that they'd been able to before. Difficult. Yeah, no. I think people would just catch on. Major UFO sighting, everybody's going to be out there filming and you're going to have thousands upon thousands of live streaming events yeah. Yeah. capturing some kind of object. What do you think would happen with the, with the public? How many would be would panic? <laughs> I think uh, I I don't think that many would, but I think a proportion would. Yeah. And certainly from ISIS's point of view, we we speculate maybe fifteen or twenty percent of the public would be psychologically frightened to the point of trauma, mental health issues, uh, because there's no two ways about it. If if it's confirmed that there is an extraterrestrial civilization or civilizations interacting with uh, our society now some people are going to say well it's like independence then they might be frightened yeah, I mean, it upends everything that we've been taught almost. and yes and, the, and because yeah. they've been lied to for 75 years literally yeah. then i think a, a proportion of the public will will feel very vulnerable yes um, i think the world will carry on i think people will still will work in the same way will still go on holiday mm -hmm. But a proportion will be affected by it, mm. and I think well, that's what Aisha is trying to say: is you know we sh we shouldn't allow this um, you know train careering down a track and then it's going to hit a brick wall. Mm. We can prevent that mm. by preparing people through educational means, mm. and that's what we're trying to do. What do you think will happen with uh, religion? It's often been debated, and certainly there was a Brookings Institute report in 1960 that speculated that there might be a huge effect on religion at that time. Uh, but I think, again, as speculation has increased over the years, we've seen, like, for example, the Catholic faith. Several uh, cardinals have gone on the record to say, you know, if there is extraterrestrial life, it's all part of God's plan, mm. and we would be happy to baptize them. So mm. I think a lot of religions now are, are becoming... Uh, or, or, or from a theological point of view, are open now to, to think that, you, that we're not alone in yeah. the universe. Okay. Th there's also a case that I know you've studied deeply in England, I, th I think it was in England in 1980. Yes, the yeah. Forest incident, yes. yeah, December Tell 1980. Tell us a little bit about that one. Uh, it's now regarded um, as the second most famous UFO case in history uh, after Roswell. Oh. So uh, it's a, clo a case that is you know, well, very I highly regarded. I should have known about it, but <laughs> yeah. I'm just well, a layman. Well, no, uh, it basically uh, is very important because it's not one sighting. It's a series of sightings and a series of interactions, mainly with U.S. Air Force military personnel, mostly U.S. Air Force security police, who encounter objects and possible entities over several consecutive nights. Mm. So that's what takes elevates it to something more than just a single event. Exactly. This is a series of events. And uh, a lot of, there is documentation through a, a US Air Force document that was released in 1983 called the Holt Memorandum. That was written by the Deputy Base Commander, Lieutenant Charles Holt. And he basically said that there was a confirmed triangular craft seen by U.S. Air Force Security Police on one night, and then two nights later he gets involved uh, in another ongoing incident involving UFOs, and he sees multiple UFOs himself. And so for him to go on the record with his rank, yeah. Lieutenant Colonel, is very, very rare that that happens. And, and of course, you're talking, you know, the U.S. Air Force indirectly admitting that there was a landed craft of unknown origin in the forest that had no markings, that was not Chinese, Russian, or whatever. It infers something else. Um, and so... Um, and one of, one of the officers actually uh, touched, one of, touched... Yeah, Jim Peniston, uh, from the first night, he touched the craft, um, and uh, he took photographs, the photographs came out fogged, but yeah, he did, made sketches and whatever and touched the craft, and he described it as being black glass-like material. Uh, but he noted that on the craft there was a uh, two-foot-sized... Uh, area that was like uh, etching that had race symbols mm -hmm. so he made a note of those in his pocketbook and uh, mm -hmm. you know it's, it's a it's a it, it's a very famous case but there's been a lot of disinformation okay. uh, by the authorities to try to 
I think, play down the significance, certainly by the Air Force, yeah. the US Air Force, the British Royal Air Force, the British government, the, the US government, they've tried to play it down. Now, I've been doing a reinvestigation over the last five years, and I've uncovered a lot of new information, and that will come out soon, within the next six months. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I believe you can't, that you can't tell when. No, no, no. Uh, but uh, within the next six months, for okay. certain. Mm. Uh, but we're looking at, I think, a rewrite of the narrative. It's definitely of I would the say UFO of, the, of that incident, or, or the whole incident. The whole incident. Yeah, yeah. many more sightings mm. that uh, that have been uh, that I found. Talked to military personnel who've now gone on the record. Yeah. Uh, other incidents we weren't aware of in the forest. And on the basis, oh. uh, so which oh, was looking forward to that. So, so, yeah. so uh, it will be contentious because mm. I think the narrative of Randleton Forest has been quite carefully controlled for yeah. the last twenty-five years. Hmm. There's a lot of stuff going on in England. I have heard you say also that there's a connection between the UFO phenomenon and crop circles. How? how in what way? Uh, I know several crop circle researchers. I'm not a crop circle researcher myself, but they will say that there is a small percentage of crop circles every year that are genuine mystery. Mm. Uh, and that Most are fake. Yes, 95% plus are, are fake, made by professional circle makers as like kind of uh, graffiti art from aerial graffiti. Um, but there is a small percentage every year that appear genuine and the crop circle researchers go in there. And many of the... Uh, it would appear that uh, they are very quickly made uh, within minutes or seconds, that they're like imprinted, that there is a burst of uh, microwave energy or yeah. some kind of energy that flattens them into the shape of whatever design is going to be laid down. Uh, but noticeably, the when you examine under a microscope, uh, say the nodes of a uh, of a corn uh, of a uh, corn, then you will find that the knuckles, the joints of the corn. Um, perhaps two or three have been blown out from the inside mm -hmm. at the knuckle point they just explode outwards yeah, right. as if being subjected to some kind of great heat yeah. uh, and that's typical of what we would call a genuine crop circle mm -hmm. so whilst most are not uh, mysterious and are made by humans there is a small percentage that are definitely under the UFO umbrella yeah. has have the um Crafts been seen hovering over the areas where... Yes, but not usually related. craft. What you have seen, and there are some various videos that have been taken over the years, small white orbs are seen in daylight flying above crop circles yeah. or near them, and they've been filmed you know, in the vicinity of crop circles. So there does appear to be some kind of connection. Fascinating. Mm. I understand that there is not uh, as much consensus within the uh, UFO community as you would have liked, uh, but maybe that I ISER is is a part well, of the I, I think attempts to to make people come together more. And, and uh, I think historically, if you look at the subject of UFOs worldwide, internationally there are some excellent researchers in many many countries and have done fantastic work over the decades, but. Unfortunately, the UFO community has very rarely come together on an international basis. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you think that this subject's really been around for mm. 70 years, you know, certainly since the and early worldwide. 50s, yeah, and worldwide, you'd think it would have a much more powerful political, not as in a political uh, dogma, but as in a collective uh, body of force to say, government should be doing this and doing yeah. that. And I think that's because groups couldn't agree on things. Mm. And that's... How, how to alert the public. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there, there was a brilliant organisation called NICAP, led by Major Donald Kehoe in the 60s, and that, uh, the 50s and 60s, and that was the best example because mm. that was more, uh, made up heavily by military personnel and scientists who had seen things and they were putting pressure on the government. But that was effectively infiltrated by the CIA, later destroyed from within, and Major Donald Kehoe mm. was ousted as chairman mm -hmm. eventually in 1970. So there's been powerful forces that have tried to play the subject down. Okay. But since then, there's not really been an international coalition, as it were. And ISA aims to fill that uh, gap by saying, look, you know, it's now time 
We're on the brink of this paradigm shift and we need to start preparing the public for what is going to be a huge shock because you have been lied to mm. without a shadow of a doubt. Mm. And that will create a, create a backlash. From a personal point of view, as and when that disclosure moment happens, I think there will be a lot of anger released by the public, the mm. media. The media, I would argue, have been complicit, but it, uh, most journalists mm. were not complicit. They, they, it was on high. It was done at a very, very high level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think you know, TV and things like that have produced documentaries that didn't want to rock the boat, no. didn't want to create pressure. Play the same game yeah, as the play the same yeah. game. Yeah. So I think, as and when we talk about this big disclosure of the big D happening, and you'll know when it's happening because you'll turn on the news and it'll be on every news channel twenty four seven like a terrorist incident. Yeah. That's when you'll know it's real. Yeah. Uh, but but realistically. I think that when that happens, there will be a lot of people genuinely angry uh, that they've been lied to for 75 years. Well, I kind of think, well, how do we deal with that in a non-violent way? Mm. Because people could really get very angry. Uh, but I th personally have speculated, based on the apartheid uh, example in South Africa, where they had truth and reconciliation hearings. And I think we're, that's what we should do. Sure. And just say, look, if you're a senior person who's been involved in this secrecy, just give your testimony. Just put it out there. You're not going to get attacked. You're not going to go to prison. Mm. But basically, let's just get this story out there once and for all and move on yeah. and deal with whatever we're going to deal with. Yeah. That would be my way of, mm. of dealing with the anger. Sounds very wise, I must, must say. Uh, you mentioned earlier this uh, the new new law in the United States that... that, that yep. um, requires the military to the whistleblower yeah, yeah well that, that, that's another one because you mentioned you mentioned this um, the rule that um, the military has to disclose what they've found to the congress to congress every yeah yeah month. Well, but well, then there's the whistleblower yeah amendment that's well. what's happening this year that's yeah, different it's very so last year was legislation that said the intel community had to report to congress by law that was passed bipartisan signed up by president biden this year, a new amendment has been created that will effectively, it's been interpreted as a whistleblower amendment. And what that means is that it's long been suspected that many, uh, certainly military people, have been involved in black projects that are really off the grid. Yeah. Nobody knew about them, uh, and they've been working on UFO projects. Well, the whistleblower amendment is basically going to say, you're not going to lose your pension. You now can come forward mm -hmm. and disclose this story in the public good and I think uh, that's likely to become law by the end of December mm -hmm. so by early 2023 I think it's envisaged and, and apparently floodgates will open yeah well the possibility of floodgates yeah. it might not be it might be very slow at first because people I think would be yeah. very nervous they can't really trust this yes yeah this, uh, is this for real kind now. of thing however what we have heard uh, from the likes of Chris Mellon and Luis Elizondo is that Certain, I should, I would think, U.S. military witnesses are being approached to give testimony before open congressional hearings yeah. that may take place as as early as wow. spring of 2023. Spectacular! Oh, absolutely, and I think that's potentially when we're on the brink of a change in terms with the mainstream media, yeah. because at the at the moment, whilst there's been a lot of coverage in the United States, many countries are still dragging their heels still want to think in it's China or Russia or something like that. Mm. However, when... Maybe that's only on the surface? And well, yeah, well, or certainly that's the way it's portrayed mainstream-wise. Maybe behind the scenes it might not be. But it, I suspect that if there are live witness congressional hearings, for the first time, the public are going to hear direct testimony from people who have been involved in nuclear weapon shutdowns, missile silos like in 1967 with Captain Robert Salas, a friend of mine. Tell us uh, a little bit about that incident. Well, basically, uh, uh, Captain Robert Salas uh, in 1967, Malmstrom, it was kind of a mid Midwest. He was underground in his bunker, basically ten intercontinental ballistic missiles. I if the Soviets launched their missiles, we'd launch ours kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And he was the person who would pull, turn the key, the dual key. He was one of those people. Well, he gets a phone call from his top side security guard saying there's a UFO shining a beam down into the bunker. 
to his underground bunker and he's like 50, 100 feet underground and then all suddenly 10 nuclear weapons go offline, ballistic wow. missiles, one by one. And these, they're not designed to go offline because of what they're dealing with, nuclear weapons. They're, they have many safeguard systems built in and yet they were overridden and 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 <laughs> yeah. went off one by one and everybody's panicking. The UFO stops the beam and off, they go, off it goes. Eventually they're checked. Nothing wrong with them. They've just been switched off by some unknown means. As soon as that happened, 10 nuclear missiles went down. One, two, three, to all to 10. Now there are fail-safe systems in all of the built, you know, the machinery. It's impossible for that to happen, but 10 nuclear weapon, weapons went down one by one. Yeah? So this guy, Robert Salas, is very famous because he went public and he was he was also backed up by another colonel who said, yes, this happened and I corroborate this event occurred. And so when I think the public hear that from a direct witness yeah. who was there. And back then he wasn't allowed to, I mean, he no, was well, to, no, that he was, yeah, to quite, yeah, yeah. But we've got all the documents since then mm -hmm. to prove it. Plus one of his uh, uh, people in charge of him corroborated and confirmed that the incident happened and it's not alone there have been incidents several incidents over the years uh, 70s 80s in particular with nuclear weapon shutdowns in america but also uh, during uh, the soviet era uh, in uh, 1982 i believe it was uh, in what was former ukraine a uh, soviet weapon nuclear weapons bunker did the opposite it went into launch mode. Mm. The UFO was seen shining a beam down into the bunker, mm. and then suddenly the missiles went into launch mode. I something that switched <laughs> them on. Yes, it was only apparently for about fifteen seconds, but apparently ten missiles came on, yeah. going down, this ready to go kind of thing, and nobody could explain it. Again, fail-safe systems shouldn't have allowed that to happen. But again, UFO shining a beam down, and it, it you can only interpret these kind of incidents as some kind of you shouldn't be messing with nuclear weapons we don't know that for certain no. but that's what you would Might logically be what they're trying to tell us yes yeah. uh, and the fact is you can only describe them as demonstrations of, of their capabilities yeah, technological exactly. capabilities yeah. and you know so i think if the public start hearing about these incidents mm. they're gonna go what this yeah. is for real they should they should. should, yeah. They should, but also the press will hopefully report on it properly and it yeah. be live. Yeah. So, what do you foresee now will happen with our knowledge about UFOs and ET presence in the coming, say, three, four, five years, with all these new legislation I, coming? I think that the legislation changes are huge. If the whistleblower amendment goes through, the implications for this subject are again huge, uh, because we could we could be faced with an avalanche of really high quality cases that we didn't know about yeah. corroborated incidents high you know very senior military people come out of the woodwork and i think if that happens that can only create pressure on what i call the dam and yeah. eventually the dam will break and when it breaks that's when you get disclosure it's not going to be a slow trickle it will be it'll culminate in a you collapse you think so yes Absolutely. i think it, yeah. yeah because it'll reach a point of no return and at the moment we're edging towards that with this legislation, uh, proposed legislation. So I think, you know, within the next two, three years, we could really have this paradigm shift. And everybody, regardless of your beliefs, acknowledges that as and when uh, official contact is acknowledged, um, that it will be the most profound moment in human history. Yeah. You know, and it surely would be because it would answer that age old question we're not alone a new era will begin a new era we will might begin also and have then, contact with other I yes mean, yes and, galaxies and whatever and the i suppose the logical question after that is is there ongoing communication now in the secret world mm -hmm. that might become more public they might release some information that they may have had contact yeah. in the secret world but if not it's yes we're acknowledging that they're real they're not ours, it's non-human. Mm. Now the question would be, well, how do we communicate with these things? Mm. 
maybe we're just ants in the playground. We may be very primitive. Yes. Uh, so they might not want to talk to us. We it might just kill them if yeah. they land on the White House lot. Mm. That's the way humans are. Mm. Uh, but we've got to get beyond that. Do you think that. we're capable of doing that, killing them even? Depending well, on what, what, what type of ETs we're talking about. I, 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 the logical thing to think is that, from my point of view as a UFO researcher, I believe that these things have been around for the last 75 years, mm. and probably and, a lot, and long, 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 a lot yeah. longer, but certainly in the last 75 years. The capabilities and the movements that are described now are no different from what was seen in the 40s. So there's nothing different. I suspect that if they have that te technological capability, they could have easily taken over the Earth had they wanted to. The fact that they haven't, and they've more or less kept secret apart from the contact side through abduction phenomena, uh, says that they're basically just to watch us and, and probably just study us in the same way that we would go to the Great Barrier Reef and study the fish, or the Galapagos Islands and study mm. all the unique forms of life there. Mm. Uh, I think we're probably a special area of interest. Yeah. For me, I've always, I often get asked the question, you know, why, why are you here? And I think, well, I don't really know, but I speculate that the, that the Earth is kind of rare. Yeah, in our exactly. bit of cosmic neighborhood, it's like a, an oasis in the desert. Mm. It's a very special jewel. Mm. And I think that from a, an alien perspective, this is a very interesting planet. Yeah. So rich and diverse yeah. in life and fauna. Yeah. It, it only has thousands upon thousands of different life. Yeah. I think we're a very interesting planet. And probably we also hold a lot of water. And they, they're yeah. betting on whether we are going to make it or not now. well Perhaps. you would you'd, you'd like to think that they if might say well yes I, uh, there's nothing to say that they're overly aggressive there have been incidents where uh, people have been harmed but they're very rare mm. so you'd have to look at the greater 75 years and say there doesn't appear to be an overt threat no. that shouldn't change in my opinion no. so I th I'm optimistic that we can work this through uh, but the, the, what we've got to do is recognize that it's time to stop lying to the public exactly. and, and, and really come together as the human race, which is what ISA is all about and saying, you know, we're not multiple species, we are the human race. We are just one species mm -hmm. and we now need to sit around the table and say, how do we deal with this new paradigm shift? Wonderful note to end on, I think. Gary, it's been a pleasure and fascinating to talk to you. Good luck now. With all Thank stories. you. And Anytime. If you liked this video and other interviews and talks on Mind the Shift, please like, share, and subscribe. I appreciate all the support. And you can follow Mind the Shift on Facebook and Instagram. And you can follow me, Anders Bolling, on all the main social media and also on medium.com. Thank you.